Hello, I'm Sherry Schaefer. I'm a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes educator here at UCSF. And my primary role for the last 25 years has been as a diabetes educator in the pediatric diabetes clinic, the adult diabetes practice, the diabetes teaching center, and the diabetes and pregnancy program. So I do diabetes across all age groups. And the first module is going to be on carbohydrate counting, which is a key strategy in managing diabetes. The objectives of this module are to explain why carbohydrate counting is important for a person with type 1 diabetes. When using insulin to carbohydrate ratios, name two pieces of information needed to calculate the dose. Explain the main limitations of using sliding scale insulin for a person with type 1 diabetes. And to list three tools available for counting carbohydrates. Carbohydrate counting is one piece of the puzzle in the complexity of managing diabetes. Uh, not only does the person with diabetes need to manage their insulin dose, they need to consider what their current blood sugar is, they need to look at is exercise planned or not, and then they have to look at the carbohydrate content of the meal. So carbohydrate counting is a method to assure type 1 diabetes insulin doses are matched to the food. But it can also be Im implemented in type 2 diabetes. Many people with type 2 diabetes use carbohydrate counting to manage portion size. So introducing the carbohydrate foods, whether you're talking about grains, fruits, starchy vegetables, legumes, um, beverages with carbohydrate, desserts with carbohydrate, they all eventually digest into monosaccharides which enter the bloodstream. So both the carbohydrate amount and type of carbohydrate will affect blood glucose levels. Carb-containing foods in the milk and yogurt group are just that. They're not cheese, butter, or cream, because when you make cheese, it's just combining the protein and the fat, whereas the milk and the yogurt have lactose. Fruits and juices are quite concentrated in simple sugars. There's grains, breads, cereals, starchy vegetables like potatoes and corn, the whole bean family, um, all added sugars, honey, sweets, and syrups, and the desserts made with them are things that people with diabetes have to consider when planning their dose. So the dose is based on three things. The amount of carbohydrate and the type that they're about to eat, what their current blood sugar level is, and their level of physical activity. So when using insulin to carbohydrate ratios, the person would be given, with the help of an endocrinologist or a doctor to figure out what their doses should be, they'd be given a ratio, and that ratio would give you information on how to cover the carbohydrate, but also how to correct an elevated blood glucose. So for example, a ratio of 1 to 15 means one unit of rapid-acting insulin for every 15 grams of carbohydrate, and a unit for every 50 over 100, as written here in blue, means they would take an extra unit for every 50 milligrams per deciliter their blood sugar was elevated above their target. And in this case, I chose 100, but these can vary. Somebody who is insulin sensitive, such as a type 1, typically needs about a unit for every 10 to 20 grams of carbohydrate. Somebody with type 2 might use much more because of their insulin resistance. So if we look at this ratio and a planned meal of 90 grams of carbohydrate, the person would take a unit for every 15 or six units for the food. The current blood glucose of 200 is elevated above their target of 100, and they would need two units because it's one unit for every 50 milligrams per deciliter over their target. So the dose is comprised of two things, and this dose would add up to eight units. Why not use sliding scale for type 1, which was the gold standard for decades, that's all anybody used to do, is give a patient something like this table that says, if your blood sugar is between 70 and 100, take four units. If your blood sugar is between 101 and 150, take five units, and so forth. That has a built-in increase as the blood sugar levels rise above target, but you'll notice it doesn't say anything about the amount of carbohydrate being eaten. Now, a sliding scale dose such as this may be more appropriate for somebody with type 2 diabetes who makes their own insulin. They're just very insulin resistant and need a layer uh, of additional insulin to help lower blood sugar, but this isn't going to work very well for a type 1. If you look at these two meals, the same dose cannot possibly cover every meal they eat at that time of day. So on the left you have an omelet with cheese 
four sausages, a piece of wheat toast, coffee, and the total carbohydrate in that meal is just 15 grams of carbohydrate. Four units may be way too much insulin for that. The very next day, they might eat a similar volume of food and have a high carbohydrate meal, in this case, a bagel that is about 60 grams of carbohydrate, a large banana, 30, and a glass of juice for 30. So they've had the same volume of food, but this meal adds up to 120 grams of carbohydrate, and in this case, four units may be way too little. So sliding scale just doesn't nail it on every meal for somebody who needs more accurate dosing. So the carb counting tools available to people include the nutrition facts labels on our packaged goods, food composition carb counting lists, there are carb counting books, some cookbooks will list the recipe and give the portion size and tell the amount of carbohydrate, calorie, and so forth. Fast food restaurants and chain restaurants have brochures. They don't always make them, them available at the counter, but you can find that information online. And there are many websites that can be used for uh, looking up information on food composition, as well as apps that can be downloaded to your phone. So looking first at the food labels, when we're thinking about carbohydrate counting, we're going to zero in on the serving size. In this case, it says one cup. And we're going to look at the total carbohydrate. In this case, it says 30 grams. I'd say the most common mistakes people make is up at the top, in parentheses, it says 137 grams. That actually is the weight of the product. And so often people see that as the carbohydrate. Well, that would be an inaccurate number. The other common mistake is looking to the far right column where you see in bold, all lined up, the percent daily value. And this one says 10%. So oftentimes people with visual problems or who don't have good literacy skills look at that number and are dosing for that number, and that's incorrect. I once had a grandmother give insulin to the child for the weight. For example, that would be 137 grams here when in fact the dose should have been 30. And that was an urgent situation where they had to feed the child juice and monitor the blood sugar every half an hour because of that overdose of insulin. Um, frequently, people look at the sugars instead of the carbohydrate, but we need to look at all of the carbohydrate, not just the sugars. And so sugar and fiber are subsets of the total carbohydrate. Of the 30 grams here, two come from fiber, three come from sugar, and the remainder come from starch. They just don't need to delineate that on the label. And just as an information added, um, the sugars here too, it doesn't tell you if it's added white sugar or if there's milk or yogurt in it or if there's fruit in it because in chemistry any mono or disaccharide would be listed under sugars. I want to talk about the fiber for a second because fiber doesn't digest. It, it is not broken down. It pushes through our entire intestinal tract, which is good for the intestines because it stimulates them and it also prevents constipation. Um, but in terms of diabetes, it does not contribute glucose to the blood. So some people should subtract the fiber when they're looking at a label and here's how you would decide. Look at the total carbohydrate. Here it's 13 grams, the fiber is one. That's insignificant. Whether you're taking a dose for 13 grams or 12 grams of carbohydrate, it's about the same dose. Whereas the other label, the carbohydrate is 10. These are both tortillas, by the way. The other carbohydrate total is 10 grams, but the fiber is seven. And if you subtract that, you're left with only three grams of carbohydrate from starch that are gonna digest and get into the bloodstream. Now, if you amplify that by having somebody that eats three tortillas, you can see that that dose mistake could be costly. So if somebody had three of these tortillas and counted it as 30 grams versus what they really should count it as, as nine, they would be overdosing on insulin. So food lists, this is just an example of what people work off of, and they have lists um, that have all the milks grouped together, all the starches grouped together, all the fruits grouped together, and each portion size on the page has about 15 grams of carbohydrate. So in time, they learn to memorize the foods that they eat day in and day out. So you can look down the list and see some things are bigger, like three cups of popcorn, some things are smaller, such as a small apple, orange, or banana, equaling 15 grams of carb. So I, I quote the word small because what do you consider small? So many people just say every fruit they eat is 15 grams of carb because they've, they've seen these lists. But in fact, that can't be true. 
a small apple off of these lists is a four ounce apple. And so it's important to look at measuring and weighing things accurately. Those measuring cups need to be part of the household. Food scales are the next level up. And so um, once somebody masters measuring and using lists, we might move forward with using a food scale. As I said, apples have about 3.75 grams of carb per ounce. This is an 11 ounce apple. So 11 times 3.75, 41 grams of carbohydrate. You do um, have access to other uh, lists that are peeled fruits. I like to give them the ones with the peeling on because then they can do, do the whole fruit bowl on a weekend when they have time and the whole thing's done. On an apple, you could write on the sticker with a Sharpie. Um, if there's no stickers on it, you can buy them at the dollar store, uh, 200 stickers and just pop them on things. Let's look at this one. So this is a very small apple and we're gonna say each ounce has 3.75 grams of carb. And this one, actually, I'm surprised it's a four ounce apple. That is really uh, 15 grams of carbohydrate. You can see how small it is. So when we say a small fruit is 15 grams of carb, it's about the size of a tennis ball to maybe the size of a baseball. If it starts looking like a softball or a grapefruit, um, that might be as much as double. Non-starchy vegetables I wanted to mention, things like asparagus, beets, broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, all of these have a little bit of carbohydrate, not as much as the other foods. A half a cup cooked is about five grams of carbohydrate, but that can still be significant for somebody who's dosing insulin exactly, such as a type one. So another tool available would be websites, and I like Calorie King, we'll demonstrate that in a minute, but the USDA also has a complete list and you can do food searches and you can find out information about calories, fat, carbohydrate, vitamins, and so forth. Some people like the myfitnesspal.com. That also comes as an app, as does Calorie King. Um, the chain restaurants usually have the www.nameofthestaurant.com and you can access just about any restaurant that way. When you get to their homepage, you look for some button that says nutrition facts or information, you can press that button and you can pull up an entire menu that has all of that information for you and print it. So we have people that carry the ones that they eat at in their glove compartments and they have them handy. I wanted to demonstrate the use of a website and the good information you can get off of one. This is the one I like, um, but there are many. And this is called Calorie King. It's at www.calorieking.com. It has a search for foods. And I'm gonna do a couple uh, searches here. Let's start with a yam. So when you type in yam and you do your search, you're gonna get a whole list that you can scroll through. I'm gonna look for baked. It's right at the top, baked or boiled. Uh, click on that. And now I have an opportunity to add the serving size. It's defaulting to cups. However, if I cooked a nice garnet yam, I'd want to put it on the plate. I think it looks better than shoving it in a measuring cup. So I'm going to use the drop down arrow and set it on ounces. Now I can use a food scale and just one quick step coming out of the oven, I can put the yam on the food scale and see how many ounces it is and plug that in right here. I'm going to say we have a five ounce yam. And you can see that right as I put in the five, it said 164 calories, it switches uh, to a label that matches your, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble here, uh, that matches your food search. So for a five ounce yam, you'll see that it has 164 calories, for example, and a total carbohydrate count of 39 grams. Now below that, it shows you the fiber is 5.5, which is pretty significant. So if I was taking an insulin injection for this as a type one, I would subtract it. I have the information, it's easy enough to do and get the correct dose. So one nice thing about these apps is you can see the fiber content. Let's do another search. Let's, let's do French fries. And we're gonna search for French fries. And when you do that, you're gonna get a whole list that scrolls quite far down. You'll have all of the different fast food restaurants, chain restaurants, information will be compiled here. But usually at the top, you'll also have the average of, you know, you cook them at home in the oven or you fry them and you have those options as well where you could weigh your french fries at home just as we did with a yam. But if I was at, I'll pick the top one, 
um, let's say I was at McDonald's, I could click on French fries for them, and then the scroll down gives me the different sizes offered at that restaurant, and I could say, we're going for the large ones, and then we'd say, oh, that's 500 calories, you know, forget that, I'm gonna go to the medium ones, 380 calories, and then I can scroll down and see that the carbohydrate is 48 grams for the medium fries, which usually surprises people, and when I have people with type 1 diabetes that find these websites, you can just see them saying, oh my gosh, I've been counting this as 30 grams all this time. And they start to recognize some of the errors that they've been making. In summary, this lecture introduced you to the rationale and tools used for counting carbohydrates. Alternatives to carb counting are addressed in a separate lecture. Some individuals are unable to count carbohydrates because of literacy and numeracy issues, and we do have sample menus, many sample menus with set amount of carbohydrates that we will pr produce for people like that. Um, and carbohydrate isn't, counting is not always necessary for somebody with type 2 who's relatively easy to control. They might need more basic guidelines instead of something so stringent as learning to count carbs. Our patients with type 1, remember, have diabetes their whole lives. So we work slowly over time, giving more and more tips um, to add to their level of knowledge. Because so, so many times they have a good amount of information that they're working from. And they might be doing 80% of the work and not getting the results that they want. And that might be um, something that a dietitian or a diabetes educator can help them with is to figure out what piece of the puzzle is missing, how, how can they become more accurate with carb counting uh, so that their doses fit their food better and they have the blood sugar control that they're looking for.